All right, thank you for staying with us on AM Live. And this morning, we're getting into the technicalities of the Kenya shilling. First, what are the factors that uh, led it to lose, was it about 24% in value, thereabouts, right, uh, in the last year? Stella, you're nodding. I hope my numbers are fine. Yeah. Uh, accurate? Okay. Um, so it was, I think, at about 120 shillings exchange rate. When this administration came into office, it is now at uh, 152. I checked yesterday. Uh, I went to the so I got into the Central Bank of Kenya figures. Moshimiwa, is this an issue of U.S. interest rates? I hear a lot about that. That uh, they're not offering favorable terms, favorable terms for their treasury bills, and so people moved the money in that direction or is this a case of uh, what was the other thing uh, that uh, was said to have contributed to it uh, the overvaluation <laughs> of the kenya shilling or uh, a combination of factors <laughs> it is a combination of factors but maybe before i get to that let me thank you only for hosting us and say good morning to the viewers. You know, you came and you just got... Oh, and we just got into the, the meat and potatoes. <laughs> into serious business. <laughs> okay. So, so, so the, 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 the issue of uh, depreciation of the Kenyan shilling is a combination of, of quite a number of uh, factors. Uh, but, but you say, as you say, the issue of the U.S. You know, the U.S., uh, w w what the U.S. did was inflation was getting out of control. Mm. And so they wanted to manage their, their inflation. And as a result of that, what they did is they, they increased their interest rates. So normally what would happen is uh, people who are outside Kenya who want to invest because the return of an investment is the interest rate. Mm -hmm. When the interest rates are very high in Kenya, you would get then a capital inflow. So they would be investing here mm -hmm. because their returns are, are better. So what happened is as a result of the U.S. now increasing their interest rates, then the investment in U.S. became more attractive. And so then the dollar started flowing back to the U.S. Because if you invest locally, you get better rates than, than in Kenya and other countries. So as a result of that, then the demand for dollar became quite high. And uh, I always tell people, uh, a dollar is just like a commodity, like another thing, like the way you have tomatoes, the way you have mangoes. When, the, when it's high season for mangoes, the supply is so much that you can even buy a mango for one shilling. Mm. When it's not season for mangoes, the, 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 the supply becomes so low that then you, can, you buy a mango for 10 shillings. Mm -hmm. So because now dollars started flowing back to the U.S., the demand became then you, you want dollars but you can't get them. So what happens? You pay more for the, for the, the, the few dollars which are around. So that was one reason. The other reason is if you look at Kenya, Kenya is an economy which is so much dependent on imports. Mm. To produce most of the things we produce locally, we, are, we, we, are, we bought a lot from outside. For you to be, to be bought from outside, then you use foreign currency, either yeah. dollar or selling pound or, or, or euros, whatever currency you're talking about. Now, for you to be bought, then it means you still need to buy that dollar. And that's why you saw the issue of the fuel, the oil. That's why the government was discussing about the G2G, -G, government to government arrangement. Yes. Because what was, we were trying to do is to, to ease the, the demand for dollar. Mm. Because I think on weekly they require about, five, if I get it right, about 5 billion to be bought of oil. I, uh, he, the president talked about, was it uh, 500? About, about 5 billion. About five, it's about 5 billion. About 5 billion. Is it per, per month? Uh, 500 million. Yeah, 500 million. Per week. Yeah, per, uh, per week. week. So, 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 you see the whole issue is now that since we are buying a lot from outside, then you require dollars. Now, the dollars are scarce. So uh -huh. what do you do? The rate keeps on increasing day, day, in and out. out. The thing we have not done well, another factor, is if you look at uh, our, our exports, because anytime we export outside, then our payments are also done in dollars. So mm -hmm. we get more inflow of dollars. Yes. And the, the, so long as they are coming in, then we, you can stabilize what we are talking about. But what happened is if you look at our exports as a country, they actually did link. Instead of increasing, they are going down. Mm. So what happens? We are getting less dollars for, for Kenya as a result of what we are exporting. That means still the demand, the gap for supply of dollars and su demand keeps on increasing. The other factor which was important is uh, tourism sector. You know, like when tourists come, 
most of them will just spend direct. It's actually a direct injection of dollars to our, to our economy. Yes. Because they go to Mombasa, they find a White Sands Hotel. They don't pay in cash shillings, they pay in dollars. In dollars, yes. So we have dollars around. If you look at what has been happening in terms of uh, tourism flow, we are also not to be doing well. You look at, at a country like Tanzania, they have actually overtaken us. They are getting more tourists coming to their country than us. And things like what, like what was happening in the JKI was not even helping us. Where you come and your box is opened and all that. So people will say, why should I go to a country where I've been harassed when yeah. I can just walk in and walk out in South Africa mm -hmm. and see the same big five, enjoy my, my beaches. So, so these are the issues. So in a situation where a country is very competitive in terms of what you are, what you offer to tourists, with that, you need them to have a very, the age is very small. And then, because you are competing with other countries, you need to be very careful what moves you make. Mm -hmm. Either policy direction or even the things you do on day-to-day -day, uh, activities. And that's what you see now. <laughs> At the end of the day, we are saying the flow of dollars to this country as compared to the demand of dollars, there has been that challenge. And that's why you see the dollar keeps on every day, every morning, increasing, increasing. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the factors. The others, Kenyans, when they found out that the dollar was becoming uh, the gold in, in town, they also went for spec. The C uh, Central Bank of Kenya, yes. um, the the explanation we got primarily was that our shilling has been overvalued for at least six years because uh, Kamau Fuge said uh, six years ago Brenton Wood institutions were saying that our Kenya shilling is overvalued. Uh, is that part of the reason? Could be mm -hmm. uh, because uh, a, a currency that is mostly overvalued is very sensitive to market movements mm -hmm. and the sensitivity is mostly rooted on the fact that investors and the general public speculate that the, that particular currency will at one point align with the market fundamentals, mm -hmm. including growth prospects, inflation, and all that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, many institutions, including also Bloomberg, uh, had um, alleged that the, I'm saying alleged because I've not verified that the currency, our shilling was overvalued. Uh -huh. So they had alleged that like around two years ago, the shilling was overvalued by around 20%. Uh -huh. But now given where it is, mm. the overvaluation has declined to around 7%. So the more the sh a currency trades at par with the market fundamentals, the lesser it is to, the less sensitive it is to market movements. So, uh, like right now, mm -hmm. the shilling is declining at an average of probably 0.4%, 0.3% per week, week on week. Mm -hmm. Previously, the depreciation was around 0.5%, they about, or above, or on a weekly basis. So, I would say that the allegations mm -hmm. could be true at some point, mm -hmm. given that the sensitivity seems to be declining as we we as the shilling depreciates against the dollar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it got a bit technical, uh, but <laughs> when okay, if it has been, uh, I think artificially propped up uh, for such a long period of time. So why did it just remain artificially propped up? Is it now the, the U.S. interest rate thing that now came and knocked it off No, no. I, I think for me that statement uh -huh. uh, might not be true. Uh -huh. Because the thing is, if you look at, as a policy, Kenya moved from a fixed exchange rate regime, uh -huh. where you would fix the price of a dollar, uh -huh. to a flexible foreign exchange regime. Flexible is where you leave the market forces to play. Uh -huh. So that, uh, depending on, and that's what I was saying, depending on the demand and the supply, supply. Mm -hmm. Then uh, it will determine where the dollar lies. So, so unless uh, Governor Fuka is telling Kenyans that we have been uh, at policy level, public, we have been at a uh, free foreign exchange regime, but it, that the government, the, the insiders of government have been on a fixed one, I don't think that statement would be true. My, my thinking would be, uh, unless he gives that explanation why he thinks that it has been overvalued, because so along. I think those of us who have traveled, I'm sure you might have gone out. In a country like, uh, like Ethiopia, our neighbors here, to, when you are getting to that country uh -huh. and you have dollars, the kind of uh, things you are subjected to before you get to that country, you can see for real that the rate of dollars here is, is, is fixed. But our country is a walk-in, walk-out. You go to a Forex Bureau here, you want dollars, you give your shillings, you get dollars. Mm. So, so 
to, to me, I think that was just a, a lame excuse for what is happening mm -hmm. on a serious note. So, but uh, so you, you attribute what is happening primarily to the demand and supply issue. The exports, us not exporting, yeah, exporting that, that's more, the U.S. Uh, Let's look at what is happening. I think it was described Basically, tightening of monetary policy. Uh, and there's something else which, uh -huh. is, which they are not also telling us. Uh. If you look at what we call the uh, direct foreign, uh, we, we call it what? Foreign direct yeah. investment. Yeah, yeah, direct uh -huh. foreign investors. Uh -huh. the, the flow direct now where investors are coming. Uh -huh. If you look at our direct for, for, uh, foreign in, inflow in Kenya and compare with Uganda and compare with Tanzania, these are investors who are coming direct from their countries to come and invest in Kenya who would come carrying dollars. Uh -huh. If you look at our level, Kenya we are around now about 700, I think worth a billion. Uganda, they are three times our time, our, 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 our level. Tanzania, they are four times our level. What does it mean? It means as we are struggling here, we are getting very few foreigners investing in our country. Uganda are getting three times. Tanzania are getting about four times. Mm. So they are getting direct injection of dollars into their country. And that's why you see the Ugandan shilling is now becoming more stronger. The Tanzania shilling is becoming more stronger compared to Tekai Kenyan. Because as we are not getting as many do as much dollars as they are getting, mm. so so to me I think this combination of factors is what is causing. But this idea has been over for six years. I don't want to, to believe that statement. <laughs> I personally I don't believe it as an economist. Stella, uh, you're laughing, but do you agree with uh, Dr. Makali Mulu's um, assessment in terms of the factors that have led us to where we are today? Yeah, the, I agree with him totally. The the factors that have led to the depreciation of the shilling are multifaceted. So there are many of them. It's not just one factor. The overvaluation bit might be a factor contributing probably 5% of what is happening. But the main, the, the bottom line answer is what um, Heshimoa has said, which is the supply and demand fundament fundamentals. So the supply is very little or... Mm -hmm way less compared to what the country is demanding because primarily the country is a net importer, meaning that we have always been below, our exports have always gone below what we import. So we import more and export less, meaning that we have to use more dollars to pay for our imports as compared to what is coming in. Another factor also is the aspect of uh, investor sentiment, mm. which is a very crucial aspect in the financial markets. Mm. So when uh, uh, investor sentiment is negative, it, work, it, plays, uh, it weighs on very many aspects of the economy, including growth, inflation, uh, currency performance, and all that. When investor sentiment is positive, it works towards the positivity of a country. So in this case, uh, investors might be well or imperfectly misinformed and leave a country in panic or so they take away their dollars. For example, what is happening in the NSE. Mm -hmm. uh, we were termed uh, a few weeks ago as the worst performing uh, exchange rate. And this one was mostly pro attributable to investor flight whereby more investors are taking their money out of the country and investing in other countries like whatever Mishimiwa has said which is the US because there they are offering better rates because of the uh, tightening of the monetary policy that you're talking about. Yes. So uh, as of now cumulatively uh, the Fed has uh, hiked their rates, their policy rate which is equivalent to CBR, the central bank rate in Kenya by around 525 basis points compared to what CBK has done by about 350 basis points. So all factors constant, people will, or investors will, will take their money out of the country to invest in such a country where rates are better and the general economy is doing better or is more developed, already developed an advanced economy as compared to Kenya which is still developing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Karibu, Mwishimiwa. 
Kimani Korea, good to have you uh, this morning. I was worried you were marooned. <laughs> we're about to send out a chopper. Uh, <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, Professor X and Iraqi spoke yesterday is a little bit under the weather. So I'm not entirely sure he'll make it, but uh, fingers crossed he's feeling better. Uh, so the point we are at, at in the discussion is this. What factors have led to the depreciation of the value of uh, the Kenya shilling? And soon we'll be getting into, are we witnessing now uh, a turnaround on account of uh, what we're reading on the front page of the Business Daily, which is uh, shilling freefall slows after CBK reigns in banks. Uh, but first, uh, the explanation that has been provided to me by Dr. Makali Mulu is that uh, it's a combination of factors. So first of all, what is happening in the U.S., the tightening of the monetary policy that uh, you found Stella explaining, uh, the, in, the Treasury bills and the interest rates, which have made it more attractive uh, to send dollars there as opposed to retain them in Kenya. Number two, the imbalance between exports and imports. Uh, and uh, they, they, at least Dr. Bakali Mulu is not convinced about the overvaluation uh, that we were told of the Kenya shilling. What's your position? Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Olive, and good morning to my fellow panelists. Greetings from uh, our CPAs across the country. We are uh, having our, four, our 40th summit, second edition in Mumbai. Oh, summit. yes! Yes, so uh. I was with the accountants the whole of yesterday wow. and, la and, and, and last yesterday evening, and that probably explains why I'm a little late this morning. But we're glad to have you nonetheless. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad that my two colleagues have, have really taken time. I was, I, was, I was watching that on my way, and uh, in addition to what they have said, uh, the Parliamentary Committee of Finance and National Planning called the Central Bank of Ghana, I think, two or three weeks ago to try to ask what is happening to the Kenya shilling. But one thing was an outlier mm. our commercial banks. So if you check the first half uh, forex income, trading income of, uh, of all our banks, especially our fast air banks, compared that to their profit the same period last year, some of them had increased their profits by more than 500%. So uh, that coupled with the increase in interest rates. So, so first of all, the, the, the interest rates are started with, with, with the US. Mm -hmm. So the, the increase in the interest rates um, as a result of inflation in the US means international investors, they had an option, they had, they had a, of course, the US is a big, much bigger economy than we are. So in terms of the risk of the investment, we appear to be a, a more risky country than, 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 than the United States of America. So we found them, those national investors, uh, choosing to invest more in America because of the increased interest rates as compared to them investing in Kenya. So what does that do? So banks, uh, commercial banks, so when, when Kenya went through domestic borrowing, then we found that uh, the investors, first of all, choose, uh, as I said, to, to, to invest more in the, U, in the U.S. market than in the Kenya market, that's one. And then secondly, so that drove the interest rates in Kenya high. Mm. We have the highest interest rates in the region at around 15.9%. So what does that leave our banks? You have money sitting in terms of your deposits. So, so you and I, the, the whatever is left in our salary sits in the bank account. The cost of that money to the bank is almost zero, mm. unless you put in a call in, in a deposit or in a fixed deposit or a call deposit account. Then the the interest rates for treasury bills and bonds have raised to fifteen point nine percent, and the banks then uh, with again we came out of, of an election. So every time there's an in, in our election cycle, it's more of a, a wait and see situation for investors. So all these challenges now left our banks with one sweetener. Don't do anything. Just um, speculate on the shilling, increase your spread on the exchange rate, and to invest in treasury bills and bonds because you get 15.9% 15 .9 interest. Mm -hmm. If I lend to you as a bank or leave, I have to follow you up. I have to check on your business. It's too much work for a bank to do. And that's why you'll find despite all the other sectors contracting manufacturing even uh, apart from agriculture manufacturing uh, all the other sectors contracting the banking sector uh, uh, q first half results were showing that the, there was an improvement mm. which clearly demonstrates that so 
if the banking sector is doing so well and their profits are increasing, where are they getting their profits from? The SMEs are, uh, uh, are contracting, manufacturing is, 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 is contracting, so where are they getting their, their, their profits from? Because of those two things. So they're not doing anything else apart from investing in treasury bills and treasury bonds, so they're not, they're not quick on lending you mm. because you're a risky uh, lender. And you see treasury bi bills and treasury bonds have uh, a, a zero risk. And then two, just uh, um, uh, playing with the spread on the exchange rate. And that's why after Central Bank now has reigned on them and said, now, we are watching you. You find out the Kenya shilling is 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 is, is stabilizing. I uh, I think this, to me the greatest factor that has led to where we are is that. Secondly, uh, Olive, um, if you check, um, if you do, if you did a demand and supply curve, mm -hmm. uh, where we have the Y scale is P and the and the and the that is Y scale and the S the X scale is Q. The demand curve, we say, is slides, it turns to, to, the, to the right, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, and that is now the, your, your demand curve. Your supply curve is on this other side. So what happened a few months ago, I think around June or July last year, with an injection of $2 billion, tried to stabilize the shilling. Uh, uh, what Dr. Makari Mugri uh, would agree with him, what they're calling the, the, uh, the fake... Uh, of the exaggerated exchange rate. So what that two billion dollars did, mm -hmm. it drove the supply curve. Uh, it made the supply curve um, slide to the right. To uh, to the right, and so we had an artificial exchange rate here. Uh, let me. This is Q Q one. This is P and P one here. Mm -hmm. So before. This is a, the, your normal supply curve. This is your normal demand curve. This should be where the exchange is supposed to be, this price. Mm. So the withdrawal of 2 billion shillings from our reserves drove the demand, you know, increase now, the uh, increase the quantity, causing the, the supply curve to shift this way to the right. So if you check, once you slide this uh, supply curve, this way to the right, the price will automatically reduce. Mm -hmm. So because of this extra supply of dollars in the market. Is this sustainable? The answer is no. This is what we are calling the artificial exchange rate, trading at P1. So with the removal of this withdrawal of these dollars from the market, because unless you have to constantly keep pumping this money to the market, and then the question is, this, this pumping of these dollars was just uh, sent to one commercial bank, which means that it's also uh, an unfair trade practice to the other banks. Mm -hmm. So with the withdrawal of this, then the the price of the dollars goes back to its normal price. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I would confidently say that where we are today is where uh, the factors of demand and supply, that's where our exchange is supposed to be. Whatever we are operating in, as shown, and the numbers don't lie, was artificial. Okay. But what would have been the point of that, artificially propping up? Uh, the, the, the artificial popping up. Okay, I, I don't. I, I don't want to talk politics into this, but we're going to an election. And going to an election, the issue of anything, our our, our elections is hotly contested, uh, contested. We have the winner. That's why the constitution gives a threshold of only fifty plus one. So it's a very hotly contested election. Any increase in prices, uh, any increase in exchange at a particular time would have swayed the election either way. Mm -hmm. And so. Come on, I would do the same if I were in office. If I, if all I wanted was to do was to win the election, is to make sure uh, let's have this election in a particular way, uh, let's have our exchange in a particular level so that sways us in a particular way. And the same thing happened to, for example, the subsidies we had in in, in maize flour and, uh, and 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 oil. Same factors. You pump money into the market. You, you you increase quantity incentivize the manufacturers or whoever it is to increase the, the quantity in the market so once you increase the the, the quantities the first of demand and supply means that now the the price will come down but then you have to keep pumping money into the market that's why even in this supplementary we still have a budget allocation to pay for the oil subsidies that were done last financial year that's where we are all all right. Uh, Moshimiwa Makali Mulu, I don't know whether you have been swayed that no, the no, value no, no, of no. the Kenyan shilling you know, was You know, as up. I said, Olive, let's get this clear. 
what what the chair is talking about is a, a shift of the supply curve. Uh -huh. Normally, what would happen is if you pump two billion dollars into a market, what have you done? What have you done? You have just increased the supply. Mm -hmm. So as I told you earlier in the morning, if it was tomatoes, this would not above harvest in tomato market. So people will now push more tomatoes to the market. So the price will go down. So long as that those that two do, million dollar remains in the market, the price of the dollar will be low. That's the exchange rate. Now, unless the chair is saying at some point, then the two billion was withdrawn from the market, and I, I, I don't think he has confirmed that. So unless he tells us that money was withdrawn, and you can explain to us how was it withdrawn, then it means that the, 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 the still the two billion dollars is part of the market. Now the challenge is, what has happened is after pumping that money to the market and that's this is what i said earlier instead of our exports increasing so that we sustain that level of dollars mm -hmm. they have gone down on the other side our imports have been increasing if you look at our import bill the kind of level we are importing the kind of things we are importing starting with fuel and other industrial requirements our imports are actually beyond the on the increase and i'm sure the investment person here can confirm the challenge has always been, it's not a matter of, I said we are not in a fixed foreign exchange regime. We are on a, 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 a flexible, what we call the free market, demand supply. And, and that's why, to me, the, I would want the chair then to, 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 to conclude that statement by saying, at what point did these two billion dollars, were they withdrawn from the market? Because I still believe if they are pumped to the market, it's just a bump of tomatoes. They come to the market, we consume them. If the, 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 the dry spell comes again, there are no tomatoes. We go back to higher prices because the tomatoes. Which are, I said, just take it that simple. I want the Kenyans to, to, to understand. But on a, this earlier point, mm -hmm. I think it's important that I comment on it because it's important. The issue of why banks are also making much more, more interest rates. Uh, me and the chair, we have been discussing this matter. If you go to these banks, most of the money they are buying these treasury bills and treasury bonds with mm -hmm. is government money. Is money deposited there by parastatos, by government ministries, and so the government is actually using government money to buy treasury bills, adding that the banks making so huge uh, profits using government money, and that's why we have been saying the chair saying it is time this country got what we call a single treasury account, so that all money belonging to the government stays with the government. I'm saying the government won't be borrowing as much as they are borrowing. Okay. Uh, and Kimbana and me we have been in agreement that this is a matter we need to fast track uh -huh. so so that uh, the government does not end up borrowing government borrowing uh, on government money just one hand taking from the, uh, the other hand but still money belonging to the same person all right so i think that's another matter so uh -huh. that's why you see the banks are making so much money because the returns on bills are now bonds is good to almost 17 percent so you just buy and sit and wait for the money and i'm sure any rational business person would you do the same? Why would you struggle running up and down looking for money when you can sit and it come your way? Okay. I'm sure if you, if you didn't have a chance to come and sit where you are sitting, money can come to your house, you still sit in your house. Yeah, I would sit in my house. Yeah. There is no life. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, but Kuria Kimani, your response to what uh, uh, Dr. Makali Mul uh, yeah. Mulu is saying? Yeah, um, I, I, you know, if it were a free market mm -hmm. and uh, all factors were held constant and there was the regular movement of goods, then his argument will hold. But this particular period was not a regular period in the country. It was an electioneering period. Mm -hmm. And every election we've had in this country has always been f not just very hotly contested, it has led to chaos. So, so the investors, anybody who, who wanted to invest in Kenya, whether it was manufacturers, anyone, it was wait and see. Mm -hmm. So you have pumped these dollars in the market. Ordinarily, then, uh, the, 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 it being a free market, factors of demand and supply would have meant that the two, uh, the two uh, million dollars would have sustained the market up to now. But then the people that are giving that money to don't want to spend it, so they just keep it. Nobody wants to to do manf to, to start a new plant. The manufacturers don't want to start a new plant. The, um, uh, the 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 existing manufacturers have scaled down their production, so. Uh, someone who has booked a cargo from the US or wherever it is or from China and they're waiting for it to come to Kenya they were like wait hold on let's not ship, ship it fast so so th there was a, a wait and see moment 
and that wait and see moment with this money again uh, sitting in the market that's why the regular forces of demand and supply after that could not work and we've seen now after the stop of maandamano mm -hmm. after the stop and now when when, when the electricity period is now behind us and uh, we have regular operation of, of of everything you've seen even the collection of revenues have increased as if you compare uh, the, the the first quarter of 2024 with the first quarter of 2023 just after elections we are doing around 14 percent better in terms of our revenue collection than we did the same period last year so what does increased revenue mean that there is now more uh, business operations why are, why is there more business operations? because now people including both kenyans and the, the international community have more confidence in the stability of this country uh, there's something else you call signaling effect uh, and let me give an example. Uh, the, the Eurobond is due next year. And uh, we have seen our peers in the continent um, uh, were not able to honor the, uh, the international debts, for example, Ghana. So the expectations of the international market on Kenya was that these guys are not going to pay our Eurobond. And so, just by the pronouncement, by both his the president and treasury and central bank that no chill out we are going to honor our debt obligations in fact we are going to pay that in advance before the due date the signaling effect that has done in the market you see now the what the world bank and imf have said okay that's fine if you're going to do that then we are willing to advance these monies to in a concessional loan at a at a much lower interest rates and now as a result of that, if we are able to access this international market to finance our budget deficit, that certainly means that the, the, the crowding effect that we've been doing by borrowing from our banks will be gone. Because now, the uh, government of Kenya will not have to rely on the, domestic on the domestic market to finance the fiscal deficit, will go to the international market. So banks now will have no option than to come and check on you, hey, Olive, been a while. So how is your salon business doing? Can we advance to you this money to, to do this? Because now they are not they no longer be able to to, to, to lend to government the, through treasury bills and treasury bills are the exorbitant interest rates we are at fifteen point nine percent which is actually not just uh, one of the highest globally but even the highest in the region. Yeah coupled by those different things that you said. And that's why, uh, at this point, I must loud um, our, um, uh, our leader in opposition, uh, and, and, and our position uh, uh, led by my, my friend here, um, Makali Moon, that the, the way of engagement has changed. Let's talk about this. These are our issues. Can you address A, B, C, D? There is, a, there, is a, there, is a, there is a question about how you imported this oil. There is a 17 billion question. Now, can you give answers to it? There is this, can you give answers to it? Uh, um, that approach, uh, instead of now saying, okay, fine, there's a problem. Let's go to the streets, let's go to the streets. And then those images, those photos that are being covered by not just local media, but national media, sends the wrong message to the world. So nobody wants to come here. The tourists don't want to come. Uh, if, if, if you're looking at a place to set up your investment, you're like, Kenya, no maybe my business will be, be, be burnt down, my truck will be burnt down, and, and, and I must really loud the opposition for the new way of the operation. Criticizing, criticizing government, uh, attempting to give better ideas where they think that, we, that the idea is better than ours, and if we continue operating like that, the problem we have uh, with the exchange rate, with uh, inflation and interest rates, will be something of the past. That election, if you're sure, if investors are sure in the next election, that you don't have to stop your investment in Kenya. You don't have to stop the running of your business because there's an election period. The election will come and go and business is going to continue as usual. If we continue to have that, then I assure you, Olive, we're going to have a much better stable economy and a much better operating space, even for business people and for investors and for everyone in the country. All right. I'll come back to you on the revenue because you said our revenue has grown in this uh, quarter one um, as compared to last year. Uh, revenue from? The revenue collected by KRA across all the all the all the tax brackets. Okay, uh, I, I will have to verify that with Julian Zamboko. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, Stella, 
if we are to say there was two billion shillings that was injected um, into the market and that now artificially propped up the value of the Kenyan shilling by through the government to government deal the idea was that we would have a loose 500 how much was it uh, I think 500 million US dollars and you said what per week available in the market so why hasn't that resulted as projected by the president because the president told us in a couple of months this was in April it will come down possibly to as low as 115 shillings Shilling, yeah. uh, let me first point out something that uh -huh. Shimewa said uh, banks it's not all rosy with banks right now and it's not mainly because of forex income mm -hmm. forex exchange income so half one he said the most of income for banks came from interest from or profits from exchange rate uh that's not the case i will use data facts and not emotions mm -hmm. because <laughs> i i know cost of living has really weighed on us as common wananchi so half one uh most profits came from interest income you see this thing of banks getting their risk-based models approved banks increasing interest rates on loans because the CBK is tightening the policy rate, which is the CBR, the increased rates on loans given to individuals. And also, this one is very evident in the non-performing loans, because if you make the loans more expensive for us, it means most people will not be able to pay. And they will not be able to pay because also the economic environment is not that much. It's not all rosy, just to say. Even if they say that revenues increased year on year, it's true. Revenues okay. increased year on year for the first quarter and even for October, the latest uh, issues from the Treasury. But they have a target. And I remember he's the chair of the Finance and National Planning. Yeah. National Planning so mm -hmm. the, the pro prorated target, which is the, this is the amount that are supposed to be collected every month, so for the first quarter, there's this amount that is said to be, co to be collected by KRA and other revenues. But the government did not achieve the prorated target. And uh, revenues fell below target by around 16%. We collected like 84% of the prorated target, the amount we are supposed to collect. And consequently, expenditures fell below target because there's no money to finance the expenditures. Also, uh, the economy is not... I, I don't know which confidence we are talking about because according to PMI data, data the Purchasing Managers Index, which is uh, issued by Stanbic Bank and uh, S&P Global, confidence in Kenya is going low because the, there's that figure they give. If the figure comes below 50, it shows that the business, private sector business environment is deteriorating. We've been in the contraction zone for like, all, all like, the whole of 2023 apart from two months i believe that is in i think january and sometime like three months ago when the figure came at 50.2 just about kidogo above improvement so the main issue is the weakening currency which mm -hmm. is making it impossible or difficult for importers to import goods and raw materials into the country and number two the elevated fuel prices which bring us to the g2g deal that you're asking about mm -hmm. So, we were promised and told this G2G deal, we are going into it because we will, it will allow us to be importing oil in shillings. No one explained how the deal be became dollarized all of a sudden. We started paying the imports in dollars. So, you see, a postponed or delayed payment does not mean that we will eventually not pay the, the fuel. So, they're telling us we are importing fuel on credit. Then after six months, we will pay the fuel. But we are paying in dollars. So these six months, it's like they are gi giving us grace period to collect the dollars. Mm. So yes, the pressure will ease on your pressure. We have to collect this amount of money in mm -hmm. one month or in two weeks or in one week. In one week, and now it will be within six months. So the, the pressure of getting the dollars is still there. The factor or the aspect of the, do, the shilling coming down to 115 or 120 was because of the shilling, shilling trading or paying the, the imports in shillings. Mm. But then it's being paid in dollars. 
So for, in my opinion, the only good thing about this G2G deal is the guaranteed supply. So remember before the G2G deal, we had issues with fuel, people queuing in mm -hmm, petrol mm -hmm. stations and all that. But now the supply is guaranteed. We will get the fuel. But the, the aspect of dollars, nothing worked. It didn't work out for us. It's, it's the oil marketers, I believe, who are buying, yes. purchasing the fuel uh, yes, in before. Kenya shillings. Mm. Okay. All right. Uh, Moshimiwa uh, Makali Mulu, that, I mean, I, when... The president said that the value of the Kenya shilling, I mean, the exchange rate would go down to 120, 115 in a couple of months. Mm. Was it? Was he off by the duration, right? That it, it was... No, he wasn't off. off. I what what, 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 what off? is happening? <laughs> and I mm -hmm. like what uh, uh, my, co my colleague is saying. Y you know, the thing is, uh, this G2G mm -hmm. was supposed to allow government of about 180 days. If you look at the the, uh, the agreement, it was you pro you supply us uh, uh, fuel, mm -hmm. and then we'll be able to pay after 180 days, and then uh, what was happening? The contract was signed in Kenya shillings, basically. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you, nobody would imagine even at that point that we would be paying Kenya shillings. What would you give to uh, Saudi Arabia Kenya shillings? What would they do with them? The thing is, at the end of the day, you are still to convert your Kenya shillings to dollars, dollars. or whatever mm -hmm. currency they will give you. But what, what was expected to happen, and I think this is what is, what is not being explained, it was expected that now after you sign this deal, every week you are supposed to be uh, sub, um, uh, importers of oil are expected to, to look for $500 million every week to, to, to buy, to, to import oil. Now with this agreement, it was expected that they will not be looking for that money because the government reduced that to only three of them so uh, the, the importation was not by everybody it, it, it used to open when it was open tender so what would be happening now and this thing will remain government didn't negotiate that they'll be paying after 180 days so within this 180 days you will you, you not require to look for 500 dollars million dollars every week so what does that do to the market it eases the pressure the, the demand for dollars mm. and so long as the, the demand for dollars is eased, where you are, you are now saving 500 million dollars every week then you have that 500 million dollars now remaining in the economy so you, you, you see now the supply side is improving so there is a likelihood that the, it was now that with that the the, the 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 exchange rate was supposed to to come to come down that was expectation but after 180 days then you are supposed to to pay still in dollars so what happened is, despite that G to G signing, the dollar kept on going up, up, and, and now the, the other factors we were, we were discussing earlier contributed to that. Mm. So I think what the government needs to do is to just own up, to, to tell Kenyans we didn't achieve what we expected to achieve with G to G, and start, stop telling us that it, it is good for the country. Because if the whole objective was to ease the demand for dollar, it didn't achieve that. It, it was a failed program. In terms of the objective, it could be now good in terms of making sure there is a supply of fuel. Mm -hmm. But what it has done, and which is very bad for this country, it has locked anybody else who was importing oil or fuel out of the market in terms of importation. So instead of going for open tendering, where you can be gaining from day to day uh, fluctuation of the Kenyan shilling, day to day fluctuation of the, the price per barrel, we are no longer benefiting from that because now we have tied ourselves to this agreement and this has a fixed price so even when the price of the barrel keeps on rising and increasing decreasing and decreasing we never benefit from this decrease because we have already signed so the competition we reduce competition and any, any situation where you reduce competition then you are also restricting the market forces so what is happening now instead of us because if you and me were importing we would be looking for the best price and when we get this oil to Kenya, we sell based on our, our, our expected returns. So we've locked everybody else out. Now we have, uh, in economics, used to have monopoly where you have only one person. Now we have, a, is it uh, oligopoly? No, oligopoly is two, three, I don't know what we call them. <laughs> maybe these are the other economies, there may be there. But we have a market where only three players now are, are the key ones. So, so they can actually decide to sit in a big hotel somewhere here. 
and agree on a price and say this is what we are going to charge Kenyans. And we are going but to if do. this is government to government, I would demand. No, would who be... is importing? We are three companies. Okay, so we, we, we need to take a break. And but, we know uh, them. We'll, we'll come back. We'll get uh, Mashimua Kuria Kimani's response. Uh, is it a case of we should just give it time in terms of the G2G's impact on the value the yeah of the Kenya shilling? On the other side of this, big P.S. you come on with your gazette. <laughs> page, uh, there's a picture of you, page 5 of uh, business uh, daily. The, the business daily. MPs start uh, 17 billion shilling oil import cash probe now that we are discussing uh, this deal. And then if you look at page 8 of uh, the Daily Nation, uh, Ms. Anjali is set to appear before the Energy uh, Committee, but uh, I read here yes, that uh, your committee also intends, uh, let me just read uh, that paragraph, the inquiry by the committee, chaired by Molo MP Kuria Kimani, follows claims uh, by Mr. Omtata and backed by opposition leader Raila Odinga that the government financed Ms. Njeri in the 17 billion shilling fuel saga. So, uh, you will tell us whether what we are reading is fake news or true on the other side of this break. On my dark marks, I've tried everything from A to Z, even vitamin C, but hardly any results. Nivea Lumina 630 works from day one, with visible results in just two weeks, and 71% dark marks reduction in 12. Join the 1 million women already using the number one Lumina 630 from Nivea. finally released from pain. That moment when you start to get back to ordinary and ordinary feels amazing. Whatever pain you're going through, release starts here. At Stanbic Kenya, we believe in your financial potential and we are here to help you reach new heights. Enjoy an attractive interest rate of up to 14% per annum on your savings. Make the most of this exclusive offer today and let your money thrive. For more details, call us today or visit a branch near you. Stanbic Bank. My name is Andrew Unalen Nasisini. I'm the Botswana High Commissioner to the Republic of Kenya. My dream for Africa 2063 is obviously your dream as the youth of this continent. We want to see potent inter-Africa trade, a bustle of commerce and industry by 2063. Kusi Ideas Festival will drive this agenda because it is a potent platform for sharing ideas. I'm inviting you to the Kusi Ideas Festival 2023. This year is being held in the capital city of Botswana, Khaburuni. See you there. All right, um, welcome back to AM Live. Behind the scenes, behind the curtains, I was also being told that um, part of also what is uh, challenging, uh, presenting a challenge in the present situation is you were saying domestic borrowing. Uh, so do you want to execute that point before the G2G? Yeah, so, um, so, so when we all borrow from the domestic market, which means that the government is competing with you and I and all the SMEs to borrow from the market. And that has increased the interest rates to 15, I think, 0.9 percent, the highest again in the region. 
But if you were to access, so, so, so uh, and again, uh, government being, uh, we call him a risk-free uh, borrower, would mean that the banks would rather lend to government than to lend to, to business people or, or individuals. But the borrowing, if, if, if this money, if, if this money that's borrowed from the domestic market was given to uh, the SMEs, for example, that would mean job creation, that would mean like, you know, even more revenue collection, that would mean um, sp spy economic growth. In the absence of that, we have to go to, uh, no, uh, but now instead of now, instead of now going, Instead of now accessing the, the, the international market, we are accessing the domestic market. Because the domestic uh, market has the effects I talked about, crowding out the private sector. Mm -hmm. But the solution would be, because we still have a fiscal deficit, if we access the international market. Mm. So if we access the international market, the, the, the money comes in, first of all, in hard currency. So if we get that IMF or, or World Bank or whatever loan, it comes at a lower interest rates and comes in U.S. dollars. Mm -hmm. So it boosts our forex reserves mm -hmm. because we don't have to worry about whether it's that G2G we're talking about, whether it is financing our imports. Because our balance of trade, we are a net importer. So we don't have to worry about those dollars because we have them already. But in the absence of that, you have high interest rates in the domestic market. But even after that, you still have to deal with the exchange rate. And the fact that now you are buying US dollars, again, it brings pressure on the US dollars, factors the money and supply, and that drives the exchange rate even further. So, so uh, our ability to borrow competitively, I mean co competitively, so that we get lower uh, interest rates from the international market, will boost uh, access of, uh, of, of credit to the domestic market in terms of individuals and MSMEs, it will boost revenue collection in the domestic market and it also is pressure on exchange rate. Okay, so, so actually this 1.8 trillion we're set to receive will ease pressure? Certainly. Okay. A hundred percent. But but maybe uh, Olive uh, on the uh, G2G and also on the issue of debt, right? Because you have talked about signaling. Mm. So we have to, like the president had talked about. Uh, Paying back our debts, uh, does that also eat into our dollar reserves, our yeah. debt obligations? It, okay, yes, certainly. And um, so, so first of all, the signaling is, uh, in fact, means that the fact that we said we're going to pay, mm -hmm. and we're going to pay in advance, it settles the confidence of international lenders and takes that out from the red, from the red, if we if just put it in plain in, 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 in plain English. And that would mean that the next time we go to access the international market, there is better confidence of the international market that Kenya is a country that will be able to pay. And, and especially coming at a time when our neighbor uh, our, 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 our 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 neighbors, for example Ghana, had defaulted. So so there was that there was that fear. But most importantly, uh, Olive, what did the Eurobond do? we are coming to pay our loan next year. It shouldn't be such a big deal if that money was spent for the correct purposes. Mm -hmm. Because if the money did what it was intended to do, there would be benefits from it. Uh, if you take a loan uh, from your circle and say you live in Kitangala, and you say, I'm spending 300 shillings every day to come to work, or say, uh, if I take a taxi because now it's raining, I, s I spend a thousand bob every day to come to work. So if I take a loan and buy a car, that means I'll save on my cost to work because I will not have to use a taxi, for example. So that essentially will not make you worse off in terms of your um, economy, your, your 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 income or your well-being. But if you take that loan instead of buying a car you go to a trip in Diani and you come back and then you realize that you didn't actually buy a car, you have a loan to pay and you still have to take an Uber every time you come to work. That is a simple way of explaining how the Eurobond Euro Euro money was spent. Let's talk about SGR for example. From Mombasa to Nairobi, makes sense. We have an alternative 
transportation if you want to go for a trip in Mombasa if you if you if you're bringing your cargo from Mombasa you have alternative transport it's cheaper it's convenient it, it is pressure on the maintenance of Mombasa Nairobi highway it saves time because I think the SGR is shorter in terms of time but it goes all the way to Naivasha tell me anybody who have used a train to, to, to Naivasha tell me any cargo that is being offloaded from Naivasha no and yet that <laughs> we took a loan and spent it to build a railway from Nairobi to Naivasha so it's like a dead investment it's like just taking a loan for your business instead of putting that money into the working capital of that business you go on holiday so you come back you have a loan to pay and you don't have working capital so the part of the pressure we have in terms of payment of this loan is on what that money was used to pay for the SGR again from Nairobi to Mombasa to Nairobi was the most expensive um, I think uh, analysis and economists and everyone has said we paid perhaps 10 times more for that construction than we should have paid. Again, in the negotiation of that loan, we didn't even, we even exempted the contractor from paying any taxes. So ideally, it was done by the national contractor, so that means there was no local employment, we didn't have any local, we didn't have any growth in employment. It didn't lead us to any revenue collection because we exempted even in production of cement and all the materials that were used in the construction of that railway. It was 10 times more expensive than it should have been. And also, importantly, if you, if you fly through Naivasha, the railway just ends. Like, <laughs> you follow it through, then in Asia too, like, it just disappears. So the economic activity that this SGI was supposed to generate that should have led to the incomes that we should have had as a country that we should use to pay that loan isn't there. Uh, that's why I'm saying it's a classic example of taking a business loan and going on a trip. You come back, you don't have working capital, and you still have a loan obligation to pay. The, the other conversation, and the Stella GQ. with an R, uh -huh. uh, before, before <laughs> you get there, Stella with an R, on, on banks. Uh -huh. If you check the FX income, I'm just checking the numbers uh, on their on their websites. Uh, Equity Bank profit for June to up to June 2023, this year 2023 was 2.679 billion. Same period last year, 1.551, 42.1% 2 growth in just one revenue income, FX trading income. Stanbic last uh, last year, no, this year is 6.015 billion. The previous year, 4.16. KCB, 4 billion. Same period last year, 3.6 billion. Uh, DTB, 2.561 billion. Same period last year, 1.456 billion. INM Bank, 1.467 billion this year. Same period last year, 1.045. Growth in FX income, Stanbic, 42%. KCB, 30%. Uh, um, uh, no, Equity Bank for 2%, Sunbeak 30%, KCB 9.62%, Diamond Trust Bank 29.13%, INM 28.56%. All just one line income. I'm not saying they did anything wrong. Come on, as a business person, your obligation is to maximize on your return. Mm -hmm. you, you owe that fiduciary duty to your shareholders. You need to grow their income. But just pointing out that part of the problem we have is that somebody saw a window and use it to make a profit. Is it a good business idea? Of course. The, the role of banks is not to provide service, is not to, to support one ninety, is to make profits. But at what cost? And that's why I have constantly said that commercial banks, in as much as you want to com uh, maximize your profits, have a little of patriotism. Because if you drive this exchange rate further, it's going to hurt you even more. Because in the long run, you cannot sustain your, your balance sheet and income statement just by FX trading income. If all the other uh, 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 votes of, of your income are deep, then naturally you're going to make losses. So just telling them, in as much as you want to make profit, in as much as you're in the business of making profits, reduce that spread. 
let us help uh, uh, reduce the spread and caution Kenyans about this increased exchange rate. On the G2G, G2G you know, um, I, I, I really want to, to, especially because this matter is coming to my committee of finance and national planning, I would not want to preempt mm -hmm. what's mm -hmm. going to happen. So, uh, only if you'll excuse me here mm -hmm. on making any comments so about this, it. So, what I've read today is accurate? Yeah, we, okay. we uh, on Tuesday next week, we have invited, so as a committee of finance and national planning, we, we oversight national treasury. And this being a payment that was made out of the consolidated fund, we, we as part of our oversight function as the National Assembly and the committee of finance and national planning, uh, the CS must appear before us and explain what happened. Then after that, establishment of facts, that's why I'll be able to comment and say, it was a good deal, it was a bad deal. And most importantly, I'll even do a report, we, as a committee, we'll even do a report in table to Parliament that will be subject to public scrutiny. So mm -hmm. I, I... So I, for clarity, I because you referenced the that. agreement, mm -hmm. so it is in Parliament, you have access to it. No, you know, this was an executive. G2G is a government. Government, normally, people would refer to the executive. Uh -huh. Normally, what would happen is some things will come to Parliament, others will not come to Parliament before they are done, but will come to Parliament after either the outer out general has looked at the books, or now someone by a committee, like he has said. Because if, if a matter is of public interest, just as much as this is, uh -huh. then the committee, being the departmental committee in charge of that, they can summon the CS. I'm also imagining my, my own committee will also be summoning him because we are also the committee oversetting the CFS expenditures, the public data and privatization. So that being a CFS expenditure will also be summoning him. So a number of committees parliament, then energy will summon him because the money was paid to, to oil companies or to, is a matter related to oil which is energy related. Mm -hmm. So the committee on energy will also summon him to find out, the, you know, this one will focus on payments. Uh, energy will be looking at the technical issues mm -hmm. in terms of these agreements, were they genuine, all that. Then our committee will be looking at, was this a genuine payment? Did it pay for, for some goods which are supplied? And I think really I want to agree with the chair that now it's coming before this committee, because they've already summoned the, the, the CS to be good just to allow him uh, to, to go through the process and then since he will table a report in the house. So that it doesn't seem to be, you know, he's a chair, he can be seen to be influencing the decision of the committee. Okay, the only so thing I want to establish yeah. is, is because uh, there the, were the statements that were made by Raila Odinga, the president reported, I mean the president responded and said this agreement is available for scrutiny by the people's representatives. Do, we, do you have access to what was said, or what uh, was agreed to? Uh, so, uh, from, from, from the information I have uh -huh. um, so far, uh -huh. that the, the, the government of Kenya had an agreement with, uh, the, the, the U, with the, I think Dubai, with the UAE, yes. on that government to government uh, deal on this buying of oil. And, and essentially, then, the, as, as I think even Stella alluded to, it would ease pressure on the importance of paying it immediately so it isn't pressure on 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 business terms working capital because even if we pay for it we don't have to pay for it in advance and remember we are in a situation whereby you have a liquidity problem it's not a solvency problem but a liquidity problem we, we don't have the money no we are we are we we have pending bills to pay we have all these expenditures that the collections you're making the is not enough to fund us. You know, we, we, are, we, are, we are constantly on a deficit. And therefore, the promise that we can advance you the oil and then you pay later, if you look at it from the face value of it, is a good deal. On the merits and the demerits of how it was done, on whether it was a, it was a contravention of any laws, that's why I said I don't comment that now mm -hmm. because it's a matter that is before our committee. Because then I would be seen to be influencing the the decision or the flow of, 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 that, of that inquiry. So uh, if, if you have this conversation in the next two weeks, then I will have an exact answer because I'll say, uh, we, co we call this person. I, I think even one of our witnesses, okay, Mutata will be a, a good witness. Mm -hmm. yeah. says, you know, come, fine, you know, and especially um, an inquiry of parliament is much more serious than a press conference. If Without 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 appearing to be to 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 inspire any 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 to appear to be rude or anything, but 
a, a, an inquiry of parliament would mean that bring documents. Uh, it, the parliament has the same uh, has the same powers as a high court at that particular time. We would examine you under oath. Mm -hmm. So fine. What are you saying? Where did you get these documents from? Uh, you, you are on record for the entire conversation. You can refer to, to, to what you said. We can refer to the authenticity of that information. Mm -hmm. So you can check. This is what you have, but can you have a printout from National Treasury on these withdrawals and compare? So if there is any inconsistencies, then you can call any person uh, of interest to that particular inquiry to shed light on it. So so it's it's it's, it's more detailed. It's, it's open to the public. You, you, it's not, it's, you know, some, sometimes I, I watch, um, yeah, uh, even even us, when, when we give press conferences and we ask, uh, uh, do you have, and then a journalist want to ask a question and they say, no questions. You, you know, and like, so you either consume what I said or if you don't, that's up to you. Mm. But an inquiry of parliament is not like that. You have to respond to questions that are asked about you. And if you have to substantiate, then you have to provide evidence. If not that, you have to withdraw or retract your statements. So, so uh, uh, I am sure that after we do the inquiry, then we will tell Kenyans the truth that this is what happened, and this is the record, and that, uh, and this, uh, these are the annexes. These are the printouts from from National Treasury, from wherever. This is this is the the, 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 the evidence from the witnesses, and we shall be able to establish the truth, not just political statements. Because, you know, uh, uh, when you're speaking <laughs> uh, in rallies, uh, and, 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 and uh, my speaker, uh, Honorable Wetangula, uh, uh, likes saying this, you know, there are some statements you can make in a political forum, but when you get to the house, you can't make them. And you, have, and you say it, then you have to substantiate it. You have to, to bring a motion in, on, on it. You have to bring evidence on it. You just can't make a statement that so and so should resign or some so and so should do this. So, so, so that's why uh, Oliver don't want to preempt what the inquiry is going to be about because it's, it's, a, it's a serious constitutional issue. It touches on parliament. Uh, it, it, so, so let's have this conversation after uh, we do this inquiry. Dr. Futa. Um, no, uh, but uh, <laughs> Stella, the, you had uh, challenged um, uh, the MP for Molo, chair of the Finance and National Planning Committee, uh, not to speak from a place of emotion but of data. <laughs> they have data, Stella. He has given us <laughs> He did his uh, research and he has submitted uh, some numbers. But um, in, but one break, I asked you, um, so the 120, 115, is it a case of let's give it time or are you saying we should not hold our breath? Well, I don't. One fifteen, one twenty, not anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that will take a bit of time for us to go back there if we do. Uh, but if the allegations that we talked about, I, I don't. I don't want to keep talking about that because my <laughs> senior is so is not believing that. Uh, the, but the overvaluation. Yes. Uh -huh. So, but if it gets to a point where. Maybe that's the par. We've not yet done the analysis on uh, where the shilling should be based on the fundamentals of the economy, that is GDP, inflation, interest rates. If we do that and we get to see that the shilling is fair at 140, mm -hmm. well, you we can talk about it and say it, it won't come back to 120 or 115. Yeah. Then that bit on, on income for banks, I... I will agree with him. I'll not prolong the argument, but <laughs> it's true. CBK rained on banks, and mm -hmm. Q3, quarter three results so far. Cooperative forex income, cooperative bank, the forex income uh, has gone down by around 25 percent. So we commend the government or CBK for that particular move. Also, there's this question I want to pose. Uh, Go ahead. Maybe. To uh -huh. <laughs> Go ahead. To the both of them, uh -huh. uh, service, the service sector contributes like 50% of the GDP. Service sector co uh -huh, uh, has banking sector and insurance and all those financial uh, institutions. So if, if we, are put, we, are, we are raining on them to not make profits, yet when we look at the NSC, uh, stock prices are really being beaten, especially KCB. What is our what is our goal? 
because in my opinion I'd, or if it was me I'd rather help banks make money contribute to the GDP as well as uh, support the NSC to make money for investors and therefore bring in more money and more investors from abroad and bring in the US dollars mm. so what is the goal why why are we why are we like interfering or it's we are saying it's a free market so demand and supply should work out let banks do their thing you work on what you're supposed to work on to bring in more investments and make ease of business of doing business easy in kenya okay i think quite a good question uh, you know the thing is as we said the, the central bank is a, is a regulator of all the banks actually one of the key functions of central bank is to put order into the banking sector and in a situation where then the bank seems to be playing what are ca calling speculative mm -hmm. because if you, if you want to play speculative you can do what you do is you just hold your dollars you don't release them and you stuff the market of dollars even when you have them so i think the reason why the central bank might be coming in because they have a whole supervisory uh, department which monitors what happens uh, on day-to-day -day basis mm -hmm. in a situation then where the banks are behaving not in a man expected of a pop, uh, pop, uh, free market, mm -hmm. then I, I don't think there's any harm the, the central bank coming in. But at the same time, as she says, we, t we do agree, all of us, that the service sector in this country is contributing a lot to the GDP, and we would wish them to contribute even more. But can this be done in a, then in a, in a, in a, in a competitive manner and in a fair manner, in a situation where, because like the chair was saying, the issues of signaling when for example every kenyan now every kenyan now knows that by june next year we'll be expected to pay two billion dollars as part of our public debt mm -hmm. that means by that time we we'll need to have those dollars to pay so anybody can clearly see that up to june next year the demand for the dollar is not likely to, to go down and that's why i want to commend the government as an economist because you know this idea of saying they are going to pay 500 million mm -hmm. in uh, by end of december as part of that repayment it sends the right signals to the market that uh, even that expectation that you are keeping your dollars hoping that by june they will be required you might be surprised that by that time nobody would even be demanding more dollars so in that case you stabilize the market so all said and done I, uh, stella we want to assure you that <laughs> if you do uh, just free market style you, you don't, uh, you don't uh, get to speculative issues. I'm sure the central bank will not rain on any other bank. But there's a matter which was uh, said by the church I want to comment on. Uh -huh. the, the issue of the way parliament operates and the issue of the public statements. Uh, where you, you call for press statements and all that. And that's why to me, you know, if you look at this 17 billion deal, the reason why the committee is summoning everybody and other committees will be summoning people is because somebody decided to go for a press release and said, this money... It's not been accounted. Could it be a mutata? Could it be a smear team? So as a result of that public statement, you can now see people are coming in and taking action. And I, I think that's the way to go as a country. Mm. Where we are not convinced, convinced that things have been done correctly, let people out there talk about them so that it becomes a matter of public interest. And since parliament is there to serve matters of public interest, then the relevant committees, the relevant parliamentary committees, will be able now to come in, just as the finance committee is coming in, and now do a more thorough job in terms of uh, bringing everybody on board and asking why this. At the end of the day, this will be for the benefit of the country because we get to the root cause. Because now you see, this 17B is being discussed all over the place. Could it be double payment? Could it be somebody paid for the whole, but also another 17 B went to some people's pockets? Mm. This will come out very clear, and I think it's good for the country. So let's encourage more press releases from Kenyans, so that parliamentarians can also now take up the matters, and we know the root cause. And uh, to me, this is very, very important for this country, and something we can't run away from. Uh, so, so as we as, as we we'll do this debate. The, the issue of the public debt is a, a major, major issue in this country. And I want to tell you, we all agree where we are. Unless we manage the public debt, we are likely to get into serious problems. Actually, my, my fear is a situation where we go either the Ghana way, as the chair say. The other day, we were, we were in Morocco discussing the issue of where the, the IMF World Bank annual meetings, mm. where Zambia has already negotiated for the shindling of their deals, uh, their, 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 their public debt. And that has been approved already. Mm -hmm. So we wouldn't want to see our country going that because immediately you go that direction, then you start saying now sending very strong signals 
that you actually you are in problems. Mm. So, so I think this management that we are doing, we need to encourage everybody to go that way. Uh, but all said and done, the only thing I don't like about the whole issue of public debt, more so from the Kenya Kwanzaa government, is where they keep on referring as if the, the, the previous regime is the, the cause of all these problems. Because mm. governments are there for eternity. It is the, the, the individuals who change. So uh, if you look at the Kenyatta government, they borrowed. The Moi government borrowed. Uh, Moi Kibaki government borrowed. Uru government borrowed. I can tell you for sure, Ruto government is borrowing. Yes. That is not a secret. They are also borrowing. But I think what is critical is, and these are basics of public debt economics, that if you borrow for productive purposes, uh -huh. the expectation is over time, this borrowing will be able to repay. Mm. And that's what you see we always talk about the intergenerational equity. For example, now if we borrow and do a, a, a SGR, as we said, and that is, it becomes a very viable investment. It is supposed now to be generating income for this country, which improves our GDP, so that by the time we end 15 years to come, the, the, that loan will be repaid, or it will be repaid from the proceeds of this investment. And that note, you don't need to tax Kenyans more. Now the challenge we have is where we are, we are borrowing, and after borrowing, you'll be surprised or olive. First of all, our application, is very poor. We don't do proper feasibility uh, studies, proper assessment, the price of the projects, so that uh, whatever we fund is something you can uh, pay. The other thing is very surprising, and this to me, this is what I think Kenyans, we have just bad financial behavior. Those are just bad, what I call financial, bad financial manners. Imagine a country which is borrowing. We are borrowing because we, don't, we are not able to finance our own uh, programs and the projects. And then we go sign for loans, and after signing for the loans, we don't even draw those loans. We have loans in this country which were signed 10 years ago. We have never drawn even a single cent from those loans. That's astounding. And, and we are paying commitment fee. One billion of shillings. Commitment fee. That is money you are paying. You are not using it. You are just, because you signed for that loan, you are not using the loan. Every year, you end up paying commitment fee. So, to me, these are kind of things I'm saying where we sit and where the finance committee sits, it's time we raided on these government institutions which borrowed, they're not using the loans, either we cancel the loan or somebody is held accountable. Mm. So that we, 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 we kind of, because to me, if you look at the constitution, it says there will always be prudent management of public resources. Okay. So anybody who's behaving outside that thing prudent, needs to be accountable right. and responsible. Yes, I'll have to call you back. Here, Lazima, to discuss. <laughs> yeah, to Tarudia. Uh, I have one minute. <laughs> uh, you, you know, um, the, the, the answers of borrowing isn't necessarily a bad thing. But we must borrow prudently. Mm -hmm. We must spend that money diligently. And we must negotiate fiercely. So borrow uh, prudently, spend diligently, but most importantly, negotiate fiercely. So those loans that we borrowed where we exempted, you know, for example, uh, those Chinese loans, money is paid out by Chinese to a Chinese farm in China, and they, they were allowed to, to import all the uh, equipment, for example, for our construction. So, the local manufacturers, for example, of, 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 of Kibaki's way of borrowing, give us the money, let's spend it. So, we had a lot of uh, uh, contractors who were doing very, very well because now they were able to get subcontracts. We had people along the way, uh, if, during the construction of Thika Road, it made, it made, it made many, very many millionaires along Thika Road. Mm. But you have these other guys who come even with their own food. Okay. They come and do something <laughs> on the side. They, they bring their own right. vegetables. They bring I, their own food. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, we must pay bills. <laughs> so I must bring the conversation uh, to a close at this point. But I want to thank you very much uh, yeah. for coming in. Uh, from Mombasa to Nairobi, making it for the show. We have uh, Honorable uh, Kuria Kimani, not only Member of Parliament, Mulu, also Chair of the Finance and National Planning Committee. Um, there is a question I know that he has not responded to, but she's very active on Twitter, so perhaps you give her the answer uh, she yeah, tells yeah, us yeah, yeah. on her Twitter. Uh, we've, also we've also had uh, Stella uh, Swake. 
Oh, yay. Got the pronunciation right. Uh, and she is an associate researcher, uh, Standard Investment Bank. We've also had vice chair of the Public Debt and Privatization Committee, uh, Makali, Dr. Makali Mulu, CPA, uh, Economy uh, PhD. So they know what they're talking about. Thank you for helping us make sense of where we are with the value of the Kenya shilling. Your world coming up next with myself, truly. Yourself, myself, truly. Uh, sitting in for Winnie Lubembe, we are discussing parenting over the holidays.